it's a great opportunity for us to be able to tell a story, um, particularly from our travels and uh, around Central Australia, South Australia and Western Australia. So as Quentin has said, uh, we've been out and about with Aboriginal community researchers interviewing people, surveying Aboriginal people in communities about what they think should happen uh, with feral camels. And uh, obviously there's been the report done in 2008, so it's been a few years since uh, some of that data was collected. Um, what I can say is also uh, with the community researchers, obviously we've got another session coming up and Tammy Abbott will talk a bit more about those people who uh, do a fantastic job for Ninti. But uh, certainly in terms of the camel surveys, I've had to uh, rely very much on our Aboriginal community researchers and it's a really important job that they do because obviously because of their knowledge, their language skills, their cultural knowledge uh, and having Aboriginal people get out on the ground to actually do the research as well. And, uh, you know, particularly with the language uh, ability that they've got, uh, being able to get better quality information back, I think, is something that has really been a highlight. Uh, as you can see, we've got 48 community researchers that are based across um, the four states uh, and the Northern Territory. As I said, uh, many of them are fluent language speakers. Many of them speak four or five different Aboriginal languages. So very highly skilled people, very knowledgeable people and uh, a great uh, asset for our organisation. Uh, we use the, the research model where we get out on the ground under a tree uh, at the front of someone's uh, house on a community and do the face-to-face -face interviews on an iPad, a tablet. So yeah, Phil, uh, certainly rely, uh, understand what you're saying in terms of the digital nomads. Uh, people out there are very savvy with technology and they love it and it's a great way to get people in. Um, so we've done 33 communities so far across those states and territories. Uh, it's not complete, uh, but certainly by the end of August, hopefully we're going to be able to get out before the end of August and do a few more communities, but uh, we'll be wrapping things up at the end of August. Um, naturally, you know, it's not as easy as just getting in a car, going out and surveying people in a community. There's permits to be done and uh, certainly, you know, having great relationships with land councils is really important. Um, and having the respect for those communities, you know, ringing up, making sure there's no cultural or sorry business going on. Uh, this year we've had a fair bit of rain through the APY lands particularly, so that's made it very difficult for us to get out there and, and do those surveys. But certainly one of the ways around it is, again, IT, is uh, getting those people to come into Alice Springs, train up ACRs, and then send them back with an uh, uh, iPad and uh, they can do the, do the surveys themselves on the ground. I think one of the real strengths as well is, is it's actually creating employment in many of these communities where there is a very limited labour market and uh, certainly the workers ACRs and I'll get Danny and Mervyn to say a few words in a minute but uh, it's a great source of employment and uh, a lot of the people out there in the communities love that type of work. It's casual, it's an on needs basis depending on projects and uh, you know there's some great rewards for them as well. Um, I will hand over to Danny and Mervyn. They'll talk a bit about what uh, their roles are. Mervyn's also an Aboriginal ranger with Jawampa out at Hermansburg, so uh, he's certainly got a lot of hands-on experience in terms of um, some of the management practices that, that they do to manage uh, particularly camels but also horses. So I might hand over to Mervyn now and say a few words. Yeah, like... Like Carl said, I'm Mervyn. We have all this problem with camels and things like that. Like, I'm, I'm a ranger as well. We do get involved with this feral animal work with camels and horses and stuff like that. You know, like, out there we, we're doing our best to fence off the main water holes, springs and other, you know, uh, vegetations and all that. But camels are too strong. They're almost knocking everything down. So, like, <laughs> we just can't win out there. Hello. Um, I'm Danny Ware. I'm originally from Queensland. Um, I'm married up to a lady in Santa Teresa. I've been there for 15 years. And I've been doing this camel survey for about half a year, maybe a year. And... That's it, eh? 
Yeah. What about your travels? With and um, jobs yeah, on? and it's taken me all over the place. Nearly one, seen different countries and communities. And it's been pretty good. Yeah. Thanks, Mervyn and Danny. That's taken a bit of courage for them to get up and speak. Normally, uh, Danny's not a quiet sort of person. He uh, loves to talk, particularly on those long road trips. Um, but look, we'll get into the summary of results so far. As, as uh, Quentin said, that it's not complete. We've still got a couple of weeks to get out there and do some more surveys. But to date, we've done 187 surveys across 20 communities. And one of the things we've identified is the amount of different la Aboriginal languages that are out there still uh, sp spoken fluently. So there's been 13 different languages identified from those 20 communities. And uh, as people have said today, you know, language is so important to people in the remote communities, connects them to culture, to country. So that's uh, also in terms of camels. There's a lot of respect for camels out there in the Aboriginal communities. People in one shape or, an or another do have some sort of affiliation with them, whether it's through uh, Christianity or whether it's through their connection with the, uh, the old pioneers, Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal pioneers in the early days as when camels were used for transport. So there's a lot of respect for the, for the animal out there and uh, I suppose that shows in terms of why people and communities don't really want to see camels wasted. The top three most common places people see camels are along the road when travelling, in the bush when visiting country or homelands, and near waterholes. So I don't think there's any surprises there. Just with that uh, photo there of the camel on the road, we are actually at Warakuna and people were warning me when I was going to be driving to Warburton uh, that to be careful about uh, camels sitting on the road and I sort of didn't really believe them. I'd never seen that before. And getting a couple of hundred k's down the road and come across this. So, yeah, you know, the, the knowledge of people out there is, is so good and you've got to take that knowledge serious and, and listen to what they're saying because that's just a really simple example of, of that knowledge and what they said to me. So, came across that uh, on our travels to Warburton. Um, how often have you seen camels in the last year is one of the questions in the survey. Majority of times are every month and a few times a year. So, that, they're the two most common times uh, or how often people have seen them. Most common damage by camels seen by Aboriginal people surveyed are to trees and plants and uh, with that it's uh, having a big impact on, uh, on trees and plants, particularly the native plants and the ability for people to be able to go out and get bush, bush food uh, and also for animals such as kangaroos, emus, you know there's a lot of communities that don't even see those native animals around their community now um, because Obviously, the camels are eating, eating the, uh, the plants and they're going to have to go away further looking for more, for more food. So it is having a big impact, particularly on uh, Aboriginal hunting uh, in those communities. Around waterholes and rockholes, so no surprises there. And again, that photo was taken, taken near uh, Warakuna and uh, the, the fence uh, there over the rockhole was built by school children probably 10 years ago. And uh, it's moved a little bit but it's uh, held up pretty well uh, over 10 years. And uh, one of the great things about uh, the work I've been doing is you meet so many uh, fantastic and inspirational people. And uh, I met a lady at Warakuna, Daisy Ward. Not sure if people have heard about her, but uh, there was actually the Ward case in Western Australia where her cousin had uh, passed, passed away in custody. And uh, Daisy took us under her wing straight away when she knew... Uh, she actually knew me from my previous job believe it or not. So she's a very switched on uh, elder. Uh, for those that don't know, I used to be a member of parliament in the Territory and uh, Daisy obviously remember, remembered me from those days and she thought I was still there but I said no, unfortunately not. But uh, she took us under her wing and showed us part of her country and she said uh, I want you to put this photo in, in that report to the government to show them what we're doing on a local level. Uh, you know, the school children built this and it's still there ten years later. So. Uh, wonderful, wonderful uh, lady, inspirational, and uh, that's one of the great things about the trips we've been doing. You meet so many knowledgeable people. Uh, and also the other, uh, just getting back to the most common damage, is to sacred sites as well. 60 responses out of the 187 people surveyed have identified working in the land management area. So again, uh, people like Mervyn, who are also Aboriginal rangers, uh, are doing a fantastic job on the ground. Uh, I think they're certainly the unheralded 
heroes in many ways. And I think in the Territory we've got about 40 odd Indigenous ranger groups uh, employing so many Indigenous people on the ground in the natural resource management area. So very important jobs people are doing out there. Um, again, 22 people have identified as having received training in camel management, but I certainly think there's an opportunity for governments to get on board and uh, to get a bit more money into the communities to train people up in that land management area. Most popular practices for future camel management. These are the three most popular things people are saying to us from the surveys that should happen in the future. So people are saying there should be more mustering and trucking away of camels. There should be more fencing uh, them out of communities and particularly, uh, I suppose, the most uh, popular story people have probably heard about is, is that at uh, Docker River uh, a couple of years ago. Um, and also more on the ground shooting for local meat. So again, this photo is uh, of a gentleman at Warakuna. We turned up that afternoon and uh, the first people we, we meet were there cutting up a camel. So, you know, um, certainly a lot of people out there saying that they want to see that meat used properly and particularly in those communities for local meat. There's also, uh, as Quentin has said, acknowledgement that there are still too many camels and the numbers need to be reduced and, of course, through aerial culling uh, that's required in many situations. Um, so that's all from me and uh, thanks again to Danny and Mervyn for getting up and saying a few words. Thanks. <laughs>